our super annoying legal department is making me read this disclaimer and I am so annoyed that I have to do it, but I have to do it. So I'm just going to get that out of the way. The information presented in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and is not intended as legal advice, advice in general, and is not meant as any kind of recommendation or any type of service offering. The information discussed may not be applicable to your specific situation and should not be relied upon as a substitute for obtaining legal advice from a qualified attorney. The podcast will be discussing the legal implications of a company going out of business and potentially not paying their partners. Please be aware that the CEO of the company we will discuss has previously sued individuals for defamation, and any statements made about the company or its leadership should be carefully considered before being shared. All statements made on this podcast are based on publicly available information that may not be accurate or truthful and should not be taken as such. By listening to this podcast, you acknowledge that you understand and agree to this disclaimer. If you have any legal concerns, it is strongly recommended that you seek the advice of a qualified attorney. In short, we're hooligans and you shouldn't listen to anything that we say. What's up, everybody? This is Josh coming to you with another episode of the Affiliate Marketing Show. Please be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest affiliate marketing news. I am Josh from OfferVault.com, the industry's number one aggregation platform for affiliate networks and offers and all things affiliate marketing. Today, we have industry legend Harrison Gewurz, as well as another industry legend, Ian Fernando, a super affiliate that's been in the game for over 15 years, who also recently became the VP of Network Operations at A4D, a company led by Jason Akatif who is a friend of the show that's fully committed to solving your marketing problems through technology. Ian, I hate to bury the lead, but I know you're in Brazil. Thank you for joining us on the, you know, your side of the, of the world right now. What's going on by you over there? Doing good. It's a uh, pretty cloudy today. We're actually in the fall weather uh, period of Brazil. Like Brazil actually has four seasons. So right now it's actually chilly and really, oh, really and it's nice. backwards. So like winter is the summer, or summer is the winter. Like hey, our yeah. summer is your winter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So after fall, after within July, it'll be winter for sure. Yep. Hey. I mean, how cold are we talking? I like I was gonna start off and be like, why are you not at the beach? And then you, <laughs> you answered the question before I could ask, but. Like, how cold does it get in the winter in Brazil? I mean, today's fairly cold. It's, uh, what is it, like 20 degrees Celsius, which is like 70. 70. Dude, what? (laughs) 20 degrees Celsius is not cold. Bro, it is, it's like 70. It's like 35. Look how cold I am. It's 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 like 35 degrees Fahrenheit here in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm fact checking myself. You're living the good life, my man. That's sick. Yeah, 20 Celsius. Fahrenheit, which it's like a nice day. It's not that bad. You don't have snow, like you don't have blizzards, right? No, nah, no. Nah. Well, we do have hail. So there are days where it just pours hail. So it's Jeez. like knocking on your window. I'm like, dude, this is going to break my window. Shit. But yeah. So Ian, how oh, long go have ahead. you been yeah, in go Brazil? Ahead. How uh, long have you been there for? Four months already. Uh, I came here last year. Was here for three months. Absolutely fell in love with it. It just reminds me of like New York. And after like two weeks of just being here, I'm like, oh god, I gotta move here. This is this is where I want to be based out of now. No. Voce fala Portuguese. No, I don't fala Portuguese. I asked if he speaks Portuguese. I just Google Translate. I didn't. Know. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was, like, I was like, damn, bro. Okay, cool. I don't fala Portuguese. I see up in that Portuguese. Eh? So. <laughs> see, you sound like you speak it pretty damn well, man. So you got that going for you. Yeah, um, right. Ian told me he he goes out at night and uh, talks to the locals, and that's basically how he he studies and. He teaches them I, English. My, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, my mom is French, and when I would go to France in the summer, I would just walk around and everyone would be like, parlez-vous anglais, parlez-vous anglais, parlez-vous anglais. So it's the same thing. That was my hustle. Everyone, I'm just like, you speak English? And they're like, no. I'm like, great, not making friends with you. Great, <laughs> not making friends with you. People would tell me they didn't speak English, and then my mom would ask them with her legit French, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I just don't want to talk English. <laughs> so <laughs> I was a loser are, in right? that regard. Mm-hmm. They're very are, proud like... of the French. 
Yeah, Yo, Ian, that. Ian, how did you meet Harrison? You briefly were telling me about it before you hopped on, but I love to make Harrison feel uncomfortable. So let's revisit that. Man, Being a- uncomfortable is good for growth. Let's hear it. Yeah, so it's a long time ago. I, I'm pretty sure it was in Vegas, um, either on the show floor or at, or at a club. I remember him having a pink flurry uh, uh, scarf. Uh, oh. sleeves. That's how I, I hate me. <laughs> right? Uh, just I think it was either in the club or on the show floor. And I just forget when. But I, I remember him sticking out because of the pink flurry scarf. And then I was like, ah. Oh, I know this kid. I read about him, and then that's when I approached you. Uh, talking about Damn, him. you read about legally him. Legally allowed to be in the club, but I probably was at the club. People <laughs> always ask me, "Why don't you really go to the club that often?" I'm like, "I got it out of my system at age 16. I'm over it." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, speaking sure. speaking of the club, Harrison, I did make another appearance. I, uh, <laughs> you know, at Ringba, we we really we care about our customers. So when a customer asks. I deliver and I was asked to go to the club. We we're celebrating one of our clients' birthdays. So I made an appearance. I really need to have earplugs with me at all times, though. That is just the problem. Uh, it's too loud. I don't mind the club if I have earplugs. Uh, so, I didn't have any, though. Harrison, on the flip side, what's your version of how you met Ian? Because you guys seem to have known each other for a very long time. I believe it was an affiliate summit and I don't remember if it was a club or a a show floor. What's funny is my first couple of affiliate summits, they were 21 and up shows and I wasn't allowed to go. And so, and I didn't want to burn the relationship and like borrow someone's badge because I didn't want to get banned from the show for when I was old enough because I knew that this is my industry. I'm not going anywhere. And I, so I would sit like, it probably was the club because I, I finagled my way into the club, but I did not finagle my way into the trade show. So I would stand out front of the show and like do meetings or take people to like restaurants and stuff. And my memory's a little blurry, but I did have a pink scarf at one time in my life. I was a different, different phase. I'm in the more of just now you're in, now you're in the uh, yellow sunglasses inside phase. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you know what good call here we go so, yeah i was gonna as say, i was right. saying i yeah. i have to be classy dress up a little for you guys so yes i remember that you pretty much were like yo what's up dude are you harrison and i was like yeah what's up <laughs> and hey. we met this was back in the era where everyone had a blog so you had your yeah. blog i believe you already had your blog at this point yeah i had my blog i think we did some guest posts a long long time ago this is like i was 15 years old like this is yeah. hilarious yeah, i gotta yeah, dig yeah. in back in the database for this but, you know, we we always crossed paths. I've seen you in different continents before. Like, I think I saw you at a sh- show in London before. Uh, I back up to the fire mm-hmm. one. That one. Uh, yep. One. And, uh, you know, we've always been, we've been pretty cool. We don't talk that often, but I know Ian Fernando. Like, if someone's like, yo, can I talk to Ian? I'd be like, yo, I'll message him on message. Bro, I, I know Ian Fernando, and me and Ian, like, really don't know each other. Ian, I remember hearing about you because I used to work with Darren Blatt at the Affiliate Ball, mm-hmm. and he would always drop your name as a, a legend in the industry when I was first getting started way back when. But it's uh, it's awesome to see that you're still crushing it. And speaking of... This leads us right into our first topic. So as a super affiliate of 15 plus years, I'm curious, why did you make the move to A4D as the VP of network operations? Did you get tired of just doing the affiliate, you know, day to day and you Plate wanted something Plate spinning of more? affiliating got old? Yeah, like why, 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 does, why does the guy who's crushing it for 15 plus years as a super affiliate, if it's okay to call you that, why does he make that change? I guess it becomes boring, right? So there's, there's always something like where I, when you launch a campaign and like you're, you get your first conversion, the building up to that campaign is the fun part. And then the conversion part becomes the boring part for me. It's like, oh, I could probably scale this. But then I'm like, eh, I don't want to, right? Because it's like easy, right? I think in part of my life now, I'm trying to look for what is next uh, for me business wise. Like, could it investing? Could, I've made some bad investments in the past, so I just need more education, right? A lot of bad financial decisions too with, uh, you know, just buying into other properties or buying into businesses. And plus the opportunity to just work with Jason is just 
pure gold, I think, in my opinion, too, right? But, I mean, that's a topic that I threw in last night. We'll get to that, but I want to ask you more about that. But keep going, sorry. It's more just like, what is next? I just don't know what's next. Like, how do I grow, right? Because in this industry, you're just either flipping Facebook accounts, Google accounts, arbitraging all day. Like, I mean, what is where, where are you technically growing once you figure out how to run a campaign very easily? Right. Like you, you could create a campaign that you actually get bored of it. Right. And for some people, like it's fun. Like for me, the money part is I've made so much that it's half become boring. Right. So where am I growing with it within affiliate marketing? It's still the same thing. Sure. I'm adjusting to the traffic sources, to new offers, to maybe new verticals, new econ products, new traffic sources, but it's a very small percentage. Like where's the true growth in affiliate marketing for an individual? Right. Especially for a solo affiliate, right? What's your day to day look like when you were first getting started? Let's go back 15 years, right? And then I want you to compare it to what your day to day looked like, not now at A for D, but right before you made that switch when you were just like, still, I'm, I'm the super affiliate, right? So yeah. like, cause I think there's probably a lot of beginners who maybe this episode is their introduction to affiliate marketing. And there's probably some other super affiliates who are seeing if Ian F Fernando still, still got it. Right. <laughs> so what was, what was the day to day and the difference of like that beginning and that not the end, but that transition to where you are now, man. So we, if we start off with me having a job, uh, I mean, it would be like, I would work three, three jobs at a time and then work affiliate marketing for like two hours a day. But eventually, some of this stuff turned into profit where I was able to get rid of two jobs and then eventually got rid of the third job and then uh, worked into affiliate marketing. But it was like only 16 hour days, right? It wasn't like a regular nine to five, you know. Yeah, that OG affiliate grind, I know. Yeah, that 16 hour days, 20 hour days, you know, just refreshing your screen all the time. Yeah, you know, full time job of pressing F5. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> Hopefully, to see, especially when you're like, I was using tracking toe two back in the day. I would always look for the, the dollar sign in there and the live spot. Oh, and like the live, could, yeah, like the exactly. where it would show like click, click, click. Yep. Money and then sign, sign, yeah. Right? Dollar sign, yeah. So obviously it was a lot of research, trial and error. At, at that time, I was running more Google uh, traffic in the, in the past. Uh, now, obviously, doing a lot of more mix. Um, but now I literally was probably only working like four or three hours a day looking at campaigns because they're stable. Is there anything like uptaking in traffic? Why did something dip down X amount? Right. Um, I even took like two years off right from affiliate marketing just because I have so much access that I'm like, eh, I don't really need to work. Right. Or there are times where when uh, you took that time off, did you get like bored or what did you do with your free time? Like what were you up oh, to man. during that time? I, just, I was going through like a quarter life crisis. <laughs> so. I'm having that currently. I, I <laughs> I, rec I recommend it for everyone. I was going to I was going to say everybody has their own version of that. But what yeah. did uh I mean if you're comfortable sharing like what did the crisis look like and how did you come through it? It was just again being um cuz at that time it was like okay, I was doing also like Amazon, I was doing print on demand, I was doing info marketing, so I was doing a whole vast. And I also just got out of a a bad partnership with uh, Nutra where we had a company for like 5 years for Nutra, killing it. And I'm just, I just needed a, a break and I just went to Asia for like two years and just partied every day. You know, I just got drunk. You just you got know. it out of your system. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know. you're in Brazil partying now, so no, never mind. Yeah, just... kind of, right? I mean, I'm not going hard, 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 right? But it's just same thing, different country. But I'm not depressed. Right? I'm not like, you know, trying to dissolve my sorrows in, in alcohol like I was, <laughs> you know, my core life crisis issues. No, for sure. Right. So that makes sense. So, well, I got a question dollar. for you, real quick. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. So, like, I I always think about how different the affiliate marketing industry is as a whole from now, like today versus fifteen years ago when I was like a, a young tyke running ads and getting clicks and leads and stuff. You know what? What are a couple things that stick out to you when you think about how different it is to be? you know, media buying and, and running traffic to offers because it's crazy how different things are. And I love yeah. your perspective on that, Ian. Um, I think the level of affiliates back in the day till now are not as creative. Like 
I'll still like, for example, I'll read like a uh, one issue with TikTok. Uh, I was running debt, and uh, they recently put up like a financial issue. You can do debt or credit something on uh, on TikTok. So I'm like, huh. I wonder what do they mean by that? Their wording. So I figured I measured all by wording so on my landing page. Figured out how many times I said credit and debt. It was like 25%. And then I slowly removed certain words or percentage of credit and debt. And every time I would get so resubmitted, if we get denied or approved, I'm like, oh, this is where the threshold is for accepting a landing page to where I can accept, push financial offers. You don't get those type of affiliates anymore that, that think like that, right? Well, to their defense, I will say this and you will agree. I mean, you were in the neutral world, so you got it. I think that the uh, the entire internet, but especially direct response or affiliate marketing, online advertising, whatever you want to call it, was much more of a wild west back then. You right. know, we don't have as many uh, IQ test SMS offers or four dollars ninety five cents shipping free trial acai berry offers or like four you know sidekick offers that are free. You know, like it, the quanti- the quality of offers is definitely a little bit better today. I think. And like, you kind of have to, you can't just be shady anymore. Like 15 years yeah. ago, people were just running, throwing shit at the wall. Something sticks. Who cares? I, mean, I see less Dr. Oz. On the oh, internet. True. that is true. That is true. I mean, back in the day, like, I remember buying Google ad for like Justin Bieber ringtones and like everything. Yeah, no one cared. Now, like there's rules now. And I think that's good for longevity. If you can adapt and you can run stuff in a clean and productive manner, like you're going to succeed the fly by night operation of affiliate marketing, which was my youth, um, you know, is kind of dead and that's, it's good, but it's, it was fun. (laughs) I do. I do agree for sure. Like I, I've evolved from that, like make that money right now because I need it. Affiliate marketing is my ATM, right? Just throw up an ad, boom, make money. Now it's like shit. I actually need to turn this to a business. What can I do? You got to try. Now I got now I got to work with the partner who to advertise it directly to make sure my leads it's good quality how to convert on their side what their true CPA, right? So learning that side of business also is very very important. So that evolution on a publisher side very very different now because before you can just run be a flyby, literally. Right now you you kind of have to get involved with everybody's business that you work with, you know. So I wanna I wanna revisit. The second half of the question, you said at the beginning, it's like, I'm looking for that dollar sign on the ticker, right? I'm hitting that refresh button. So what did the affiliate game look like when you were at year 15 and you were Ian Fernando and everybody knew your name and you're crushing it? Like, what did your day-to-day look like and how was it different from the beginning? Uh, I mean, literally it's just like throwing up a campaign, three hours of work. There's really no big difference. Um, There's probably simple research that's happening in looking at ad spy tools. Since I already have so much knowledge in the past, I kind of just know what to throw up right away, what kind of layouts I need, what kind of ad or angles I need to go after. Um, so not really much work. There's really, there's no complications in the work that I do now as a publisher, whereas before there's a lot more because of understanding the algo, click bidding uh, ruling, I'd be thinking about more different angles back in the day, what work, keyword targeting. Now, just it's just so much knowledge in my head that's just a checkbox in my head now, right? So literally three, max three hours, four hours of work on and off, uh, you know, and just maintaining, watching. I'm not even going after for like the hundred K months anymore. Like as long as I'm maintaining certain campaigns that are constant, because what, what I hate is campaigns that scale and then they die off. And then it's like two months of like no traffic, no Mm. income. Like, okay, where do I go with certain offers that will stabilize, right? I don't want to scale too much because it might just tick off the Facebook traffic algo and just kill it. (laughs) Those are the things that are, that worry me more so, right? What would you tell? uh, Real quick, I was just going to say, I think that one of the biggest changes I've seen from the affiliate mindset of 15, 16 years ago versus today is that people are beginning to think long-term. The analogy that Adam and I used is when we kind of made the transition and began to build Ringba and, and, you know, made other investments and built other businesses, the, the analogy was we're done spinning plates and we actually want to build something. 
Yeah. And I think that that is an important mindset shift that this whole industry has seen. Um, yeah. Like you just, you just spoke the word of it. Like it's how it is. It's pretty cool, honestly, yeah. to hear that. I think it's cool that publishers like to build like I example, like I like enjoying building the campaign. Right. Um, and it was fun. Again, the conversion part in the maintenance becomes like the annoyance part for me nowadays. Right. Uh, but I mean, now I can just throw the analysis into chat GPT and tell me which one's, which one's better. <laughs> Ian, we're not allowed to talk about chat GPT anymore. We've spoken about it for probably like 75%. And they refuse to give us money for sponsorship. No, we, yeah. we haven't actually tried, but no, <laughs> they're just kidding. Ian, I was going to ask you, like, what's something you would tell that newbie 15 years ago if you like that you wish you would have known when you were getting started that you have acquired, you know, over the past 15 years that you feel like really would have given you a leg up if someone's watching this? they're getting started. What would you like really tell them to focus on to, to kind of skip a lot of the trials that you had to go through? Trials, man. I don't know about trials, but I'll tell them like collect leads, like always collect leads. Like if I had my email list from like my blog and then the Nutra days, I can literally just throw out an email, write it up in 30 minutes or an hour. And then that would be it. Most of my day would work. Right. So like I'm during the Nutra days, we had like a million records of like buyers. We had another like three, three point something of like contacts. And if I was, if I kept that warm throughout the years, I can just literally just throw up an email a day and just be good with it. Mm. Can, so um, to, to comment on that, how, how would you suggest collecting leads and making contacts like that? Like what, what were your best methods of doing that? Well, it's shooting a vertical, creating a simple opt-in. Like we were doing stuff for like uh, an ebook to affiliate offer. That's what I would do. Right. I just, I tell a lot of people to always usually do that. Right. It's just a landing page. Right. The only difference is you'll probably get a 2%, 3%. What I've noticed is a 2%, 3% uh, down in your LPCTR, but you have the lead, you know, so that's the most important part. Right. But it still acts similar as a landing page, you know. So instead of getting a 60% LPCTR, you probably get like 57, 56, 55 LPCTR just because there's an opt in in there. But it just tells you that the lead is more qualified because they're taking an action right? and hopefully they turn into conversion through your seven day email series. Right. So quantity quality over quantity is what you're saying. So you might lose a couple of visitors, but your quality overall is going to increase. You might make up that difference in a, getting a bump on the offer you're running because the quality is so damn good. Yeah, exactly. So Harrison, I mean, what I, would, I, I would, Oh, go I, ahead. I, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off. No worries. I, I just always tell publishers just to always collect because if if I had that list today, I wouldn't just I wouldn't be working. I'd just be like collecting leads every day for that same new stuff and just sending an email a day. Easy, you know. So Harrison, I was gonna ask you the same question. Like, what would you tell the guy wearing the pink scarves, you know? Don't wear pink don't fucking scarves. Okay, no, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Don't wear. laughs> we both okay, okay, we're we're on the same page here. Um, no, you know, I think that uh, when I was younger, I probably could have been a little more frugal. I probably would have said, don't buy jewelry. Um, you know, you, you've made bad financial decisions. I, as well, when I was younger, uh, have made plenty of bad financial decisions. Um, so, you know, that is a lesson learned. Um, but, you know, I think that I, I guess I would tell myself, now, if I was talking to me then that I should start to, I should, I should have that spinning plates analogy. I wish I saw the light on that a little bit sooner. Cause I'm really proud with the businesses we've built and what I've done, but you know, it's really a grind when you're affiliate mark, when you're being an affiliate, you're going hard and you know, you're having these seven to 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, whatever K days. And you're, you know, you're netting 40, 50% margins. And then you wake up one morning and that shit just burned to the ground. Like that's mentally taxing. Like yeah. there's this, this little story and I won't go into too many details, but Adam and I had a, had a business about nine years ago now. And it was a, you know, close to six figure daily revenue business for almost like two years. Like we crushed it. And one day there were some browser updates, Google changed some rules and that we thought the server was down and no, it was like, we just got nuked. Like it was zero. And that was actually kind of the moment where we went, huh? Like that was fun. We crushed it. 
I tried to like save face, like hey, let's let's relaunch, let's get our, and we realized like no, you got to just build, you know, build something that lasts for the long term. And so I would tell myself to look at things that I can build for the long term because if I had started that mission when I was younger, probably build some cool shit versus like just trying to find another diet offer or dating offer or pin submit to promote. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember when I first first started, um, I bought a house because back in the day, all these bloggers were buying homes. I'm like, I can buy a house too. So I'm just going to buy a house. Right. And then I think like a couple months in, my revenue was losing like five to seven K a day. And I actually got into like depression, like my first depression. And it was so bad because like it was like three months of like no, no revenue coming in, just losing money trying to figure out why. And at that point, I was like, damn, did I get in this industry by accident? Am I actually really good? Do I actually have talent? Am I good at marketing or was it just by luck of the draw, right? And that's what was racing through my mind back, back then. But eventually things got back up, uh, you know, slowly, slowly uh, racked up a bunch of credit cards, but came back through, you know what I mean? But yeah, those days where it just gets nuked and you're like months without revenue, that's the downside of affiliate marketing for sure, right? And that's like, the ugly side of it too right those days when you wake up and you're like shit i got no campaigns running or i'm breaking even or are painful um you know i had a funny discussion like 10 years ago with someone and he said that he stopped his campaigns because they weren't profitable enough and i i know this isn't fully relevant but i just i want to share it because i always baffled me when he told me this. he's like yeah i was making like seven percent margins ten percent margins, so i just stopped it wasn't worth my time and i'm thinking like dude what the fuck like if i make if I spend a hundred dollars and I make a hundred dollars and six cents, I'm keeping the ads running, bro. Like, come on, right? Exactly. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, so now at that point, it's like, oh, is it optimization? Am I what I do need to adjust? Is it campaign structure, right? So let me try to negotiate a bump on the offer. Let me go run write some new ads. Let me see what I could do to increase my you know CTR on my landing page. Let me up my quality score with Google. Let's try some new ad sets on Facebook. Like keep hustling yeah. man i when i heard that i was like this dude's coasting like come on bro the, so the affiliates, a lot of affiliates are coasters nowadays i've noticed right so that's that's a big i gotta difference. be careful on this one but I, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people coast and there's a lot of people that have very successful businesses and <laughs> they could be more successful if they didn't coast how's that i'm saying true, politically true, correct true, today true. definitely agree definitely agreeable yeah ian where do you see the affiliate game going in the future you've been around a pretty long time i know we like briefly touched on where it was and where it is now but like where do you see it uh evolving to over the next few years and how do you feel like you're gonna have to adapt to like stay on top i don't think it really changes i think it, it adjusts right it adjusts more like i think everybody's gonna need a broker for a lead for sales right um only adjustment the industry does is getting used to new traffic sources, getting used to like AI development, for example, you know, creative adjustments, you know, where do you get video content? Like how do you adjust from doing all creative from like image to now video, right? Um, like for me, I recently just adjusted into paper call, like just last year. And that's a very interesting topic, right? Or maybe like five years ago, like more into... <laughs> more into uh, push over pop, right? Or maybe three years ago, I got more into vertical videos, right? Versus uh, creators. So I wouldn't say the industry changes, it's just ad adjusting, you know what I mean? So that's how I see Because everybody can need a broker. Everybody needs referrals. Everybody can need um, somebody to give them sales, right? So that arbitraging, I don't think will ever change, but the, uh, adjustment of getting used to new concepts, ideas, evolutions of the industry. You just got to adjust to it, I think. You know, I, I agree with most of what you said, but there's one thing that I, I think that I disagree with, and it's you mentioned the new traffic sources. I think about 15 years ago how many more traffic sources existed than today with what we run. You know, there's been a true consolidation in a lot of the traffic sources where now, you know, the majority of traffic is coming from Google, Facebook, TikTok, it's like 
that's a lot. Now there's definitely those push networks. There's definitely domain yeah. traffic. There's definitely, there's still pop-ups, there's still video ads, but I, I, I think like continued consolidation is a real thing. Um, yeah. You know, the internet has become like double click was its own thing. That's Google. You know what I mean? Instagram was a separate thing. Facebook now has their own, you know, you know, they're everywhere. So I, I agree with you there though. Uh, one thing that I believe, and I think that, you know, I, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I think it's it's harder to just be the affiliate that buys traffic on Google, throws up a quick landing page and generates some leads or throws people to calls. I think now people have to actually build products and not like an offer. I mean, like a directory or a site that's resource intensive and has, or, you know, for a customer, like there's resources. If we're talking about credit repair, financial services or insurance, it's not just like, here's my insurance lander call for Medicare or call for yeah. ACA, whatever. You got to actually invest in what you're showing the customer and focus on quality content and like building something because these big companies that are buying calls or buying leads, they have media buying teams too. And you got to, you know, I guess you could say in today's world as a, as a media buyer, as an affiliate, you have to prove your value a little bit more, which I think is good because it's going to teach those coasters to stop coasting. Um, yeah, 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 but I mean, know. as a solo affiliate for sure, it's, it is hard. Um, that's why I think a lot of affiliates have evolved into teams, agencies, two partnerships. One get the resources, talking to the advertiser direct. One running the media buying. One setting it up. Right. I think that also is just an adjustment in the industry. Consolidation. It also, I think you're right. It's also an adjustment. Like native traffic, like almost Taboola and Outbrain almost, or Taboola almost buying out, out Outbrain, right? It would have been a crazy consolidation of that source as well. But yeah, I mean, there's so many traffic from like Quora to Reddit, but all the volume was obviously with the tier threes, uh, tier ones, you know, Google, Facebook, YouTube. There just used to be a lot more tier two and tier three now, you know, and now it's like, that's still there, but it's not what it was. And and I, I, I do say, and I'm not actively buying media these days, you know, but I miss those options because I had a lot of fun with those. Those where you could like make a build a relationship with someone, spend a shitload of money, make a shitload of money, and like good luck building a relationship with Google. They don't really <laughs> like they don't like anyone. <laughs> yeah, I dude, I remember we were spending like close to half a million with Google for Nutri Days, and we got they gave us a plaque of on that day when we spent our first million with them. They gave us a plaque. Uh, you know how like Google changes their uh, their screen or logo every day? They sent us a plaque of that day of what the logo was. I'm like, dude, that's what we get for like spending money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I just I just rolled my eyes when you said that. I was like, damn. All right. Yeah, it was like falling apart. You're like, dude, yeah. really? Okay, I guess that's what we'll. I'll do you remember? Do you remember what like it was? What was the day? Like, what were they celebrating? Yeah, I don't know what the the. Yeah. Item yeah that's always like a fun game when i open my browser i'm like hmm can i figure out what this actually is for yeah no, i have no clue you know i was like it just came in the mail i'm like thanks for your first million and it was a picture of the local a box logo. of tic tacs and a shitty google logo right yep. pretty much it yeah so it is what are, it is are you still doing a lot of work with google ian Nah, most of my traffic would be internal with uh, A3D currently. So mm -hmm. I test traffic now with them and then pass it over to the internal team, you know, so. So I know, cool. you, I know you travel a lot. We briefly talked about Brazil and I know basically you were kind of a digital affiliate marketing nomad for, you know, eight years. And honestly, it sounds like you might still be in some regard. So I'm curious, like, you know, I asked you what the typical day looked like from the beginning to where you are now, but I'm curious, like, how does the travel affect your day to day? What are some of the challenges associated with travel? What are some of the beauties of it? And what would you kind of say to an affiliate who maybe is buying a one way ticket to Thailand and they know what their work is going to be, but they don't know what their life is going to be? Ooh, man, that's, that's a crazy question. I don't know. I travel with a very, very open mind where I think getting lost is very important. Um, losing yourself uh, in the city, just rediscovering yourself, is, I think it's important, right? As a publisher and affiliate, 
I think routines are very important. I have a very strict morning routine. Like I don't pretty much start my day till like 10 o'clock. Right? Well, can I, can I jump in right there? I'm really curious. Can Wait, you walk do you us- wake up at 10 in the morning or you start your work day? <laughs> can you, my work day. can yeah, you yeah. walk us through the morning routine unless it's like super personal and you don't want to share, but yeah. I'm curious. Cause I think a lot of people like we, we talk about routine on the show all the time, especially in the morning, non-negotiable wake up times, meditation, stuff like that. So what does your morning routine look like? So I'm usually up by 7.30, pretty much automatic since the sun hits my window. Um, I'm up, you know, I go to the bathroom, take care of the manly stuff, right? Uh, then I pull out my yoga mat. I do my stretches for 15 minutes, meditate for another 10 minutes. Then I go to the gym for an hour and a half, dependent. You know, cook breakfast, do a little errands in the morning. But that's pretty much my fixed routine. Like, I have to do my stretching, yoga, meditation, gym in the morning first, for sure. Like, before before 8 o'clock. Right? If you need any tips on, on the gym, Harrison's your guy. I don't know if you follow him on Insta, hey, but he's... Him, he's yeah, he's, I see him on Instagram. Pumping him to irons. He's getting after it. New PRs every day, bro. Uh, so that's that's actually really interesting. I have my own morning routine. It's similar. I'm not really working out, but I always try and meditate. I find my day is always a lot more balanced when I do. And one of my favorite quotes is like, if you don't have the time, if you can't find, I think it's Tim Ferriss, maybe. It's like, if you can't find 10 minutes to meditate, you should probably find 20 or something like that. But uh, so it takes you to 10 a.m., and I think that's dope because you're not putting out fires as soon as you wake up. So what happens at 10 a.m.? I log in, check stats. I go, you know, now that I'm with A4D, check the tickets, how's their traffic, what did we do yesterday, how are the revenue, right? Why are we down? You know, I just create a whole list of, like, errors of what I got to look for. So every morning, writing out notes of what I got to do, right? So Dude, I'm a big notebook guy. Yeah. Same. Love love a good cross off, dude. Nothing feels better. Exactly. exactly. I feel like I need to share my routine now. So Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, we all we all we all watch it on Instagram every day, but yeah, you can watch oh, it. You that. asshole. <laughs> well, okay. So I I have to say full disclosure, my routine's gonna change. I've been in Scottsdale, Arizona now for a couple years, and on Saturday I'm actually moving to Miami. So if you're listening and you're in Miami, you should say what's up because I'm new to a city. I want to make lots of new friends. Um, but I typically start my day with my Arizona routine at 345. It's real. See, I didn't just make that up. And I wake up, I eat a small snack, and then I drink pre-workout. I have a special one that it's called Crack Gold Edition. It makes me shake and feel like I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> I spend about 30, 45 minutes checking emails that I got overnight, see if anything, you know, needs urgent attention. Um, and then I'm at the gym Monday, Tuesday, or yeah, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, I go at 5 a.m. On Wednesdays, it's 6. Um, I do an hour workout, come back, protein shake, sometimes have some egg whites, which taste terrible. Um, and I just start working and I grind pretty much nonstop until about 2.30. Then I got a 3.15 workout. After that, I get home, except on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do Pilates after the workout. Um, and then I work for like maybe two, three more hours, go eat an early dinner. And I try, but usually fail to be in bed before. Like I try to go to bed at eight 30, but I usually am going to bed at like nine 30, 10. Um, I definitely meditate. I usually meditate before bed actually, but sometimes when I have that free hour after I wake up and go to the gym, I, I actually will meditate if nothing happened and I'm feeling a little on edge or something. I'll just, I do like a, I use the insight timer app, which has a bunch of free meditations and I really like it. And it tra- tracks me. I got to like 64 days uh, in a row. And then I burned myself one night and I didn't meditate till after midnight. So like I didn't break my cycle, but the app is like, mm. so yeah, that's I was you gotta, really you gotta hit up. You got to hit up the tech team over there and see if they yeah. can help you out. With no, that. I, I'm holding myself accountable. So I lost my streak. But um, yeah, like. I think having a routine is really important. I was actually, so I'm here in Vegas right now. Uh, I was at the Medicarians trade show. Reba has a big booth here. And I've taken my fitness levels to an extreme level of douchiness. So I actually brought a trainer with me. And I was telling him this morning, like, dude, because he trains me in Arizona. I said, dude, I'm really scared about like my routine. Like I got to have a routine. He's like, don't worry, bro. You got a month. 
you'll figure out you'll figure out your routine you'll get your routine but like that's one of my people are like are you scared of moving i'm like no i'm scared about my routine i'm going to be like so inconsistent for the first little bit so yeah. routine is key that's for sure yeah. especially when you travel for sure like i try to bring that routine wh wherever i go but the first week is of like you know jet lag definitely ruins it but as long as i have that routine i don't even have breakfast before like nine o'clock right uh, so I wow. straight to the gym. Empty Bro, stomach. I don't even I don't even eat breakfast, dude. I do like intermittent fasting, not by choice, but just because I slam coffee and it crushes my appetite. And then I eat like a massive dinner. And that's kind of I don't know. It's not even like I know people like consciously try to do that. It's just like how my body works at this point. I don't know. I was going to ask you, Ian, though, do you have like a non-negotiable like bedtime, if you want to call it that, like to make sure you get a certain amount of sleep or you just kind of like wing it depending on what yeah, you got so going on? Most of the week. I, most of the week, I try to be in bed like by 10 for sure. Uh, but I do go out a lot. Um, but I, I try to be home before 11 for sure. Like last night, I was home by like 10 o'clock, you know. Uh, so I was able to get in bed before 11. But I do try to get in like at least six, seven hours for sure. Uh, so I, I got a digital nomad smell test for you. Two questions. <laughs> do you yeah. live in an Airbnb or did you sign a lease? Oh, this is a great question. We were just talking about this. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, this is now a lease, but was an Airbnb. Okay, then you have retired from digital nomad life. <laughs> you are officially adulting in Brazil. Congratulations. Well, I, I am. Thank you. Thank. You. Well, I am trying to like settle because the. Big so you want to stay there for a while? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm working on my digital nomad visa right now, which will give me two years here. Oh, that's cool. Um. So yeah, because again, I just fell in love with the city, and plus the big issue I'm trying to now resolve in my life, like relationships. Right, because the dating scene is hard when when you leave in the country every ninety days. Right, so that's one thing. Well, I I just realized you, we said you were in Brazil, but I don't actually said what city you're in. So where are you at? Uh, Sao Paulo. Nice. Have you explored some of the other cities in Brazil? Have you traveled around the country at all? Like what what is yeah. what's like the yeah. difference between like I think Sao Paulo is inland, right, and Rio is on the water. Yeah, Rio is on literally on the water. Yeah, I was in Rio last year. Amazing. Uh, definitely smaller um definitely a little bit more dangerous but it was cool you know what i mean um like you can see if you're on the beach you can still literally see people from the favelas rob people on the beach like every day right so even like you'll see them at gunpoint it's like it's just normal to everybody on the beach it's like a right? chick in a in a bikini getting pointed a gun at her to take her phone <laughs> wow that's rough okay yeah. and then i went to uh south uh bahia which is another i flew about 30 minutes Oh, no, an hour and a half flight from here. That's also near the mm -hmm. coast, and that was fun. Uh, but very, very hot. So, but I like. I'm a city person. I'm not really a nature person. So, let's talk about uh, A for D and and Jason. You know, you mentioned like you got a little bored of the affiliate life and like working under a guy like Jason. Like, what more needs to be said? But I really would like to know, like, what is it like? working with Jason, uh, you know, for anyone who didn't watch our episode with Jason, I would highly recommend it. I believe it's episode two. And I think it's the most viewed episode that we have, if I'm not mistaken, but it's either episode two or three. I'm, I'm I'll check. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's two. I'm the moderator here. Don't ever question <laughs> me again. All right. Uh, so I want to know like what, what, what's it been like? Like, is it, I mean, whatever you're comfortable saying, but like, is it a little bit intimidating? Are you feeling challenged in ways you haven't um, before? Yeah. And and if so, like, what are some of the challenges and how have they impacted your growth as, you know, a business person and a human being? I mean, Jason definitely challenged me a lot for sure. Um, so when I had my businesses, what I realized as a business owner, especially during Nutra, and like my Amazon stuff is like, I hated being like a CEO, right? Um, I just hated dealing with employee dramas and things of that nature, right? It's just, it was just so petty to me. But now that I'm helping Jason with a network, uh, he's pushing me to do the, doing more of the delegation, like understanding how to delegate properly without being so forceful, demanding, things of like that, right? Whereas I know before I'd be like, Damn, why, why, who cares about this? Let's just do this, right? Being super aggressive to my employees. Whereas now it's just like, well, you make sure you, you have trust, make sure you care, don't do it in a demeaning way. Like he'll coach me through a lot of stuff, which is very, very helpful. Um, but it's also intimidating because when numbers are down, he'll, 
you'll ask why numbers are down and of like, well, there's an issue here, there's that, right? Um, and I hate being. He probably has good feedback though when you're dealing with those issues. He probably can help yeah. you strategize and stuff. For sure. No, for sure he does. The problem is I, I, I always hate giving him bad news, right? Because it's like, like disappointing, like your favorite uncle or your dad, right? Like, like, oh, sorry, I couldn't get it. It's like, it's very hard, right? He's such a, a legend, super knowledgeable that you don't want to disappoint him, right? And that's, that's the intimidating part that I have with him, right? <laughs> so what are some of the ways you try not to disappoint him? Like, do you have some things that you really focus on? Or is it just kind of like you have that fire under your ass and you're just working as hard as you can? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm working as hard as I can for sure, but it's a lot of strategizing with the team, trying to push them to, you know, get more publishers, get more publishers to run specific offers. Now that we're getting into the paper call uh, space more so, and a lot of our publishers over that AE has are more lead gen, e com. So I'm trying to work with them, trying to get them, hey, let's I'll help you find these uh, call publishers, right? Let's do this. Maybe we need to go through the email newsletter. Let's go through your book of business. Let's start getting on more phone calls, right? How do we strategize with your publishers? Can we, you know, evolve them from a lead gen person to, you know, a, a call person, right? So it's more of a strategizing part, which is uh, fun, but also like uh, not fast resulting, right? Because if Jason wants, you know, results tomorrow and I'm starting a strategy today, that strategy doesn't get planned until probably the end of the week or next week, right? So, yeah. And was it cool, Jason though. who like said like, "Hey, you're a legend. I would love to have you on my team." Or was it you that said that to him? Or was it over years you guys kind of just kept talking? Hey, I'd love to do something with you. Like, how did how did all this come to be where you actually ended up getting on the, the opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. Um, John Vogel reached out to me because um, they were, Jason was looking for a campaign strategist to help publishers scale their businesses. Uh, so it would have been a good idea if where I would. And so I first came on board to help publishers scale, like going from like 10 figures a day to six figures a day through, through strategy, through maybe campaign restructuring or whatever, just having another mind to talk about their campaigns. But it, looked, it literally took me like two months where I, I was deciding, arguing with myself. Like, do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Um, and then I was like, sure, I'll do it. I think the, the idea is to just get knowledge uh, and expertise from Jason. That's where I see the value for me, right? Because again, I'm looking for growth as a person and Jason definitely can deliver that, right? So. What uh, kind real of... quick, uh, oh, Josh, yeah, go ahead. you're right. Jason was episode two, not episode three. I <laughs> yeah, am wrong. Dude. I take accountability when I'm wrong. Ian, what kind of uh, discounts are you getting on the yachts? On the what? On the yachts. Oh, yachts. No clue. No clue. He just you haven't me. shopped for a custom yacht from Jason yet? Come on, dude. Step it up. Yeah, Ladies. Exactly. I have to step it up. You're right. Exactly. <laughs> so you guys started without me? What the fuck? I was about to say, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Young from Ringba. How are you, Adam? What's going on? I love the hair. Good. Okay. Late. Sorry, guys. I had to take a meeting at this trade show that's going on right now, but I just wanted to pop in and say, what's up, Ian? Thanks for coming on the show. Of course. Of course. <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Dude, Ian's been crushing it. This has been a, a great episode. Uh, at, Adam, I mean, now that you're here, like, why don't you hop right in? What do you got? What do you got for Ian? Any questions? Adam did extensive uh, show prep, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I am curious, man. Like, what what was it like for you going down to Brazil and changing your diet entirely to, like, the local food as opposed to what we eat up here in America, which is generally pretty shitty. Like, I'm just curious how that process went, actually. I mean, I don't eat a lot of local Brazilian food. I I mean, I, I just go to nice restaurants here. Uh, like they're really good food. Like a lot of Japanese food is very, very good here. Uh, nice. I, just, I read that the lar I think the largest Japanese yep. population outside of Japan is in Brazil. Yeah, exactly. I was just gonna say that exactly. Yeah, yeah. So they have like eleven Michelin star restaurants here that are just purely Japanese. So I mean, like sometimes I'll 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 uh I'll have local food when you know I have a girl, but 
I mean, most of the time I'm going to nice, nice restaurants, like decent Thai restaurants, Thai places, you know, Japanese food more specifically, right? So no change really. Cool. <laughs> Actually discussing food and now that we're, you know, graced by the presence of the Adam Young. Adam, I, I saw on Instagram, you had a dinner in Vegas with 20 CEOs. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, on Monday night, I hosted a dinner with our good friend, Sam Malamed, who is the CEO of NCD Insurance uh, and also one of the partners in Medicarians. I don't know if that's public or not, but guess it is now. <laughs> and uh, so he had hit me up and asked if I wanted to host a CEO dinner with him. So we looked at all the CEOs who were attending the show and tried to pick out a really amazing group of people, not just because they're CEOs, but also, you know, who's interesting, who's working on really cool projects mm -hmm. and from different areas of the industry. And then we all invited them to Hakkasan uh, and had the big private dining room there. And thank you to Harrison, who put together an unbelievable menu for that. It yeah. was outrageous. We got through the I was full when they finished the I, appetizers. Yeah. Literally, yeah, I, I like, fuck. I peeped, I peeped the menu because I think you posted a pic. It looked pretty insane. Yeah, we literally have 20 pounds of leftovers in the fridge over here. <laughs> I'm going to uh, go have Chinese cool. food after the pod. Like, oh, it, we got so much. Jesus. But we love hosting events like that. And, um, you know, I, I, I actually met Ian at a, a Geek Out event recently. I mean, I, I've known of him for, for over a decade. You know, we're both old, old people in our industry. Um, but I met him at an event. And so I, I really love these types of events hosting CEO dinners and other type of dinners like this, because anytime you can get 20 brilliant CEOs in the same room to talk about anything, like it's not just like new business comes out of that. The world will literally change. Like if you can get 20 incredible entrepreneurs together, put them at a table and get them talking about the things that they're passionate about, they literally will go out and change the world. And so I absolutely love being involved in events like that and hosting events like that. And we try and do it regularly. Um, and it was it was such a great time. And so thank you to everyone who came. I have like no doubt that some incredible changes in our industry will come out of just uh, that dinner. Are you able to tell us like, what some of the discussion topics were from a bird's eye view because I well, know like, actually takes... josh we have a rule at the dinners it's no pitching no snitching so no but what <laughs> i will say is that it's just a mo it's like a mind meld like we we weren't only talking about business we were talking about things we're passionate about outside of our work things we do in our lives and like it was really just like a really great group of people just talking about what they're good at, what they're, you know, and what we're not good at, what we want to do better, what we need help with. We, I think most people at that dinner brought up a, maybe an issue or a problem that they're dealing with and trying to solve in their business. And, you know, people that don't even do the same thing, like that are completely in a different, you know, wavelength or different kind of world. Like not everyone there was an internet marketer. There was a lot of people that are on like the services and software side for Medicare insurance, like providing software to insurance agents and stuff like that. But they were able to just give ideas and feedback just because everyone's like, we're in a safe space. Everyone kind of trusts each other because they're at this dinner. And so everyone's kind of willing to share and open up and help each other. And that's why it's such a great vibe at those types of events. Yeah, I remember like back in the day when I was my first affiliate uh, show, oh no, my second one, I wanted to do like a dinner with just publishers that I wanted to talk to, like the high end one, like back in the day with like Charles No, Wayne Sheriff, uh, Chad, you know, and just having a dinner and just paying for everything just so I can uh, absorb. Just soak up knowledge like a sponge. Yeah, and then that turned into Thanks a Thanks for the invite, Ian. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I also didn't go, but I <laughs> fucker. <laughs> you know, Josh, I actually would like to give an award. I'd like to give a trade show award on the show right now. I would like to give the trade show award for the biggest fucking balls to the CEO of Health IQ, who actually showed up in person at this event and hung out with some of the people he owes tens of millions of dollars to and isn't paying so shout out to that guy 
Wanted to thank him again for not paying a whole bunch of our clients tens of millions of fucking dollars. Really, he had the money for a pass. Yeah, yeah. and so I got to give him some props, buddy. Way to take our clients' money and use it to buy uh, trade show passes. Probably nice hotel rooms, but I will give it to him. Took some fucking balls to show up. Damn. That is wild. Nice. Damn, I'm, damn is just, right. You own the episode. That was lit. Yeah. <laughs> did you uh did you get a chance to speak with him adam no yeah so people just did. we know did and they had some friendly conversations though yeah i just got to meet with a bunch of my customers who saw him here who were very upset that they still haven't been paid their tens of millions of dollars and so as a software provider in the industry it's pretty frustrating to hear that someone like that uh, just isn't paying their bills. And not only that, he won't even talk about it. So, um, and by the way, I invite him on the show. I would love to have him as our special guest to talk about what happened at Health IQ. Please come on the show. Let's have an honest, open conversation about it. I won't even harass you about the debt you <laughs> owe my customers. And <laughs> let's talk about when things go wrong. I'd be happy to talk about the times I had to do mass layoffs and my businesses went under and I had to move I back. I can talk about my failures at EWA. I'll get vulnerable. We'll have a vulnerable yeah, so let's like do it. therapy gotta, and podcast. <laughs> yes. So we invite you. Please come. <laughs> uh, Ian, I'm curious. Ian, have you ever had a situation where you've been owed a bunch of money or you've gotten blocked <laughs> or you've gotten burned and uh like how, how did you kind of you how much does harrison owe you yeah how have yeah. you actually oh. <laughs> how how have you actually uh how did you handle it like what would be advice to some of these people i'm sure health iq is a, a bigger issue for them right now but what did well, you do I, to I, get through I it i don't have really i mean i've had payout issues but i think one big one was uh a promoting offer in um Europe and uh, so they, they had to pay out in like uh, US dollars uh, in their dashboard. But because I think the euro was adjusted, they adjusted that pay at like $30. But I ran the traffic for it for maybe a, a week and they would, wouldn't pay me that difference of like the three or four dollars. So that kind of annoyed me. But I mean, all you can do not is not quite on the same scale as Health yeah, IQ. Yeah. Scale. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had, I mean, I haven't really had like big payout losses uh, and I've been very, very lucky with that just because I've had a good relationship with uh, with people, with my AMs and plus I have a blog, right? So like I remember shouting out like Direct Track for being a shitty tracking platform. They wanted to pay me like- dude, Direct Track, that's, I, yeah, <laughs> dude. <laughs> and then they wanted to pay me like 10K to take that post down. I was like, nah, I'm gonna keep it up. Right. Um, they actually want to even fly me down to their office to discuss how to make your tracking better. I mean, I'm, I've just been very lucky. I've never had very big payout issues just because I think my name uh, burdens weight in the industry and it's very effective, I think. So I think that's another reason. So I never had a really big issue in payout besides that small, small uh, issue with uh, currency exchanges. So. so Ian, I was actually going to ask, you mentioned the blog. And I know Thanks you're... for not asking me that question because we need another hour. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned the blog, and I know you're you're deep in the A for D life right now. But do you have anything else going on, like outside of A for D, that you're still really busy with or that you're passionate about? Uh, not really. I still have my Amazon FBA stuff, my some of my print on demand stuff, but they're pretty much all technically automated. Like I don't even touch my Amazon FBA. Uh, my VA does most of the work. I just fill up with a credit card. Uh, it gets shipped to a shipping center that ships to uh, Amazon, right? I mean, instead of making like the traditional 12% ROI, I'm now doing like seven or eight, depending on the products, right? Uh, but also Amazon is also a different beast. It's, it's just me arbitraging too as well, right? Um, the print on demand stuff, uh, also very automated, it's via Etsy, right? It's just super, super easy. So not no really big projects. A lot of my time is with A4D strategizing and growing, growing publisher base, from growing up to revenue, things of that nature, but obviously working with Jason closely on, on strategizing on the network side. So. 
Yeah, Adam, right right as you got on, we were asking him what it was like working for Jason. Uh, do you have any questions for Ian about that or anything uh, anything else before we let him get out of here? No, I mean, look, I like Jason a lot. I think he has a really great mind on the leadership side, and I think he's willing to be vulnerable and learn from mistakes and grow as a human. And so as a leader, I love where his head is at. I know we see eye to eye on this. Like I, I've talked to Jason for hours about this shit. And um, so, you know what? I already know how Ian feels about this because I understand who his leader is. And so I don't need, I don't need to ask any questions because I know if Ian goes to Jason and says, Hey man, I have an issue with this, or I see an opportunity or something else that he's going to make the time to talk about it and to deal with anything and to go after new opportunities and to hear his people out and provide, try to provide them with the best, the best future possible. And so um, the only thing, the only advice I would give to Ian is just don't let this dude pay you in yachts, get your cash, bro. <laughs> Yacht mean is it's very expensive. <laughs> well, Adam, again, is there anything else you want to ask Ian? We basically ran through the agenda, and I just want to make sure you get all your your thoughts out there. Are you all set? You got anything no, else? I, prep for this. I don't have any questions. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, I think uh, you <laughs> added some. You added some fire. I added mean, some... dude, this might be our best episode. Like, holy shit, you came in hot, Adam. <laughs> Woo! Did you like do dude, jumping not, jacks look, before you came on? I am not. I am not not okay with companies not paying legitimate publishers for the work they did. It affects hundreds of people in our industry, and it takes food off of the table of all those transfer agents who don't make a lot of money. You know, and everyone loses their bonuses. And it, it, it was completely unnecessary. You know, if there was a little bit of honesty, we're like, hey, we're having some trouble. Don't don't blow us out at the end of AEP. But that's not what they did. They called everyone. We're like, send as much traffic as humanly possible. This is what I'm told. Get your own legal advice. This guy sues people for defamation. This is allegedly what happened. And we have not this verified is allegedly these claims. What happened? is all the account managers were calling all the publishers and saying, bring the volume. And then the moment AE, AEP closes, they fire a, a th like a thousand people, according to Glassdoor reviews, okay, allegedly fire like a thousand people, and then they don't pay the bubs. Yeah. And so the fact that they're not blackballed from the industry is unbelievable. Like I... Actually, this is kind of this is kind of interesting. I mentioned, you know, Jason's episode. It's one of our biggest ones. We actually dive into to the health IQ situation like pretty deep on that because that was actually like and right when it was going conservatively, on. Very conservatively, Adam has turned on his not. Yeah, dude, though. that's why I was like, whoa. Because I mean, the first time, thinking, like, do we need to send this to legal? Like, holy <laughs> shit! None of this makes it on the actual Look, episode. I'm not saying anything that's not, that's not true. I'm not telling you anything that isn't like common knowledge at this point. Like Health IQ didn't pay their bills. I haven't met a single person that's a publisher that got paid after AEP. Maybe they did. Maybe they paid some. I don't know. Right? Like not I don't know all the details that we claim to know. I just know Ringba has a whole slew of customers that are out there holding the bag. And I don't like it. And yeah. I think these people aren't communicating to the publishers. They're not apologizing. Like I know my friend last night, friend and client just wanted an apology. He's owed millions of dollars. And he was just like, can I just have an apology? Like, will you just talk? And they won't. And so that to me is unbelievable. And you know, like Ian over there, he, he doesn't really have any non-payments. I never did as an affiliate either. You know, I you have some I, really quick, Adam. Really quick, if you were harmed during EWA, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look though, Harrison. When that shit when that shit went down, though, you and I were friends. We weren't doing biz, and you were trying to make it right with people. And I know for a fact that. It wasn't your fault and that you the tried intentions to were never malicious. It's true. And we're gonna do an yeah. episode where we dive into that deep one day and we've talked about it. We haven't done it yet, but I just figured you mentioned that, so you know what? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So look, I think if bad things happen, good business people should talk about it. And you know, sometimes you can't work it out. 
but at least if you can communicate, you can find ways to, to try and make it right. And I, my observation, my personal observation about the, this situation with Health IQ, from what I have heard from third parties, is that they're not attempting to communicate or make it right. And I think that's where the anger comes from. And even if they would just communicate a little bit, I know there are lawsuits that are happening and stuff, but like, guys, come on. You know, I had an issue once that was lawsuit related and our attorney told me, do not call that person. And I said, fuck that. And the first thing I did was call him and say, hey, here's what happened. I'm super sorry. I apologize. I don't know how it happened, but I'm calling you even though my attorney told me not to because it's the right thing to do. And if I can help in any way, shape or form, let's do it. Let's just work it out. OK, you know, and I saw this person a few months later, we shook hands at a trade show and he's a great guy. And I don't I don't think that Health IQ would be worse off if they behaved in this fashion, if they just treated their partners like humans and just acknowledge the situation, maybe even apologize for it and then try and work some things out with some people in the industry. That would be the right thing to do. It might be painful. It might not be the most fucking profitable, evil thing you can do, keeping all the money, okay? But it might be the right thing to do, and an apology goes a long way. So again, I invite the CEO or any C-level person from Health IQ on the show. I'd love to talk about this situation, and I get that there's lawsuits, but who cares? Let's have an honest conversation about this. And if you won't talk to me, you should talk to some of these publishers, apologize and see what you can do to make it right. Because if you do that, you can show how great a company you are. Hey, we made a mistake. Hey, we made another one by not talking about it. But hey, we apologize. And we're going to try and make some things right. That would be how you impress all the other CEOs in the industry. That would be how you make an impact. And that would be how you preserve your brand and take your company forward in our space. But if it's just going to be silence, non-payment, and angering the people that you screwed over, allegedly, right? Uh, that's not, it's not earning my respect, right? And I know a lot of other CEOs feel this way. I've had a lot of conversations about it. And so I think when bad things happen, leaders should lead, own their mistakes, and try and rectify them. And that is how you build a great company. Damn, I'm done. I don't how you really feel. <laughs> Dude, I was about to say, preach. Ian, uh, uh, any final thoughts before we let you get out of here? No, I'm good. I, I, I always try to people or try to tell people to like travel, be open minded. I think it opens up a way, uh, open up your mind to a lot of imaginary business ideas for sure. Right? I think traveling just purifies the mind in, in a lot of ways. So that'll be my last round. So. Well, again, thank you for coming on, man. Seriously, great episode. Definitely want to have you back sometime later this year whenever the schedule permits. But uh, really appreciate all the insight you shared with us. For Josh from OfferVault.com, Harrison Gewurz, the industry legend, as well as the CEO and founder of Ringba, Adam Young, plus the super affiliate and industry legend himself, Ian Fernando of A4D. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We will see you next time.